Welcome to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast, your guide to future tech trends and innovation in a language you understand. Now, over to your host, Neil Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Blog Rider podcast and a big thank you to Dave Willits in the UK who is responsible for me spending money on things that, yes, I might have wanted, but let's be honest, I don't necessarily need. And for people that missed it, a few days ago, I asked everyone listening to send in their best Amazon Prime Day deal discoveries. And Dave sent me a great deal and a few codes and workarounds that enabled me to pick up a Ring Doorbell 2, an Amazon show, with a, which is like the Echo, but with a screen, and an Amazon Dot. All, all three items for just £135. And I believe full price now, now Prime Day is gone, is nearly £300. So... Yes, I got myself a bargain, thanks to you, Dave. But I now find myself with the full surveillance package, and I don't know if that's a good thing or not. On a positive note, I can sit back in my podcast chair and say, Alexa, start my day, and be spoon-fed the latest tech headlines whilst I drink my coffee and slowly come round in the morning. But if there are any good flash briefings that you can recommend, please let me know because most of them look pretty naff from what I've seen so far. But a big thank you to Dave. I've told my wife you're to blame for me putting this on the credit card. So so keep a low profile for a few days is my best advice. But hey, neither of us know where you live, so I'm sure you'll be fine. But let's get back to the show and using technology to solve real problems. And today's guest is Young Wu, and he's the CEO of Mars Discovery District. And they're the largest innovation hub in North America. They're based in Toronto, and they support over 1,300 startups. And they're working in everything from clean tech, health tech, fintech, AI. I could go on and on. But in the last couple of years, something that's really stood out for me is that tech talent has surged from the US and over to Canada. And one small part of that is their welcoming immigration policies. Not to mention world-class AI research institutions like the Vector Institute and government support. And VC has followed too, hitting high record levels. And we're living in a world now where immigration is a hot, hot topic. What fascinates me, if we were to look around at the entire world, technology is removing geographical barriers at a rapid rate. And that's a good thing because, as I always say at the end of every episode, technology works best when it brings people together. So we're banishing old stereotypes. We're working together. The fact that I'm talking to you here in the UK, today's guest is in Canada, and you're probably listening in any of 165 different countries is proof of that because we're no longer being relied on what the media tell us. We're learning together that we're all the same, with with the same hopes, dreams, fears, and wanting to make a difference with our time on this planet. But today, I invited my CEO, Young Wu, onto the show because he's played such a big role in that transformation. And he's also helped shepherd Toronto from being an afterthought in the tech world to a city known for innovation and diversity. Now, that's my kind of language, so buckle up and hold on tight so I can beam your ears all the way to Toronto so we can speak with Young Wu, CEO of Mars Discovery District. So, massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell the listeners a little more about who you are and what you do? Yeah, thanks, Neil. It's uh, great to be on your show, actually. So, my name is uh, Young Wu. I'm the uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Mars Discovery District. Um, before Mars, maybe just a bit of context for me, I, I, I've spent my entire life as a serial entrepreneur and, and an investor. So I spent most of my career actually starting and building and scaling uh, my own companies and driving liquidity events over you know, several different companies across a bunch of different sectors. Um, but uh, now at Mars, um, I've got the privilege of leading the largest urban innovation hub in North America. We have over a million and a half square feet on our campus, uh, over 1,300 ventures. Uh, they employ about 13,000 people in our entrepreneurial community. So we're very, very proud of our entrepreneurs who are essentially our North Star. Um, and uh, so, that I mean, that's a bit about Mars and we can, you know, uh, go from there. 
Fantastic. And the Mars Discovery District is the largest innovation hub in North America. And like I said, you're based in Toronto. And I believe you support over 1,300 startups working in clean tech, health tech, fintech, AI, and so many more. But can you tell me a little bit more about the story behind your success and how you got where you are today? Yeah, sure. You know, the, the vision of Mars was actually created by our founder, um, Dr. John Evans. And um, he's probably, in my view, and in the view of a lot of Canadians, probably one of the top Canadians um, over generations. Um, he uh, was originally uh, the president of the University of Toronto. He was also the president of McMaster University. He was a dean of the medical school over here. And you know, the original uh, uh, hypothesis of Mars really came from Dr. John Evans. Mars is actually built over the original site of the Toronto General Hospital. And uh, when the Toronto General Hospital decided to retire its original building, and by the way, this is the building where insulin was first administered. It was discovered right across the street from us at the University of Toronto, first administered at Toronto General Hospital. So the intent was to turn this site into a condo development. And Dr. John Evans just wasn't having that. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a particularly unique building. Is right on top of the subway line, right across the street to the north of us is one of the top research universities in the world. That's the University of Toronto. And just to the south of us, connected by tunnels, is the University Health Network, which contains some of the top research hospitals in the world. So, you know, uh, between the U of T, the Mars campus today, the University Health Network to the south, the financial district to the south of that, and right across the street, one of the top energy organizations in North America, the Ontario Power Generation Group, which is one of the largest and most diversified clean power generation facilities in North America. You essentially have, you know, the largest urban innovation hub, Mars, in North America, with a district surrounding it that is one of the most, you know, the densest discovery, research, and commercialization districts in the world, too. So that's how the whole thing came about. But it was essentially led by Dr. Evans and a consortium of business leaders and philanthropists and government to essentially acquire this land, develop it. And, you know, after going through the crawl and the walk and the run, and I think we're heading into a sprint now, we're finally seeing, you know, the fruits of all this going out. And with the exception, of course, of knocking down a historical building and wanting to build a, a condo over the top of it, from the outside looking in, it really feels like Canada is incredibly forward thinking and building this thriving tech scene over there. I mean, is tech talent surging from the US to Canada thanks to these welcoming immigration policies that I've been reading about lately? Yeah, there's no doubt about that, Neil. You know, the, the immigration policy here with the Global Skills Strategy Program, from the, the Canadian federal government has really help talented foreign workers and their families come to Toronto and Canada, they actually turn applications around within a two-week process. That's a huge boost in terms of creating the brain gain effect that we're seeing. Uh, but I'd say, you know, that's an enabling factor. I would think there's other major drivers as well. Um, I know from the tech space that, you know, talent does fuel the tech and innovation ecosystem. And the best talent always wants to work with the best. So I think that's where it all starts. This is the spiritual home of artificial intelligence with you know, Dr. Jeffrey Hinton based out of the Vector Institute, which is actually on the Mars campus itself. So essentially as a spiritual home for one of the biggest and most pervasive cross-sectoral trends that's going on right now, um, he has attracted you know, fellow scientists and researchers and engineers from Harvard, from NASA, uh, from uh, uh, all of the top, you know, Stanford, and they themselves attract, you know, others that want to be surrounded uh, and, and, and to hang out with them, too. So we're, we're starting to see the brain gain happen because uh, we do have some of the best talent, lovingly called, the Dr. Hinton is lovingly called, the godfather of artificial intelligence. Uh, and, and then, of course, the government has put in place some wonderful our immigration programs to make it really easy for talented foreign workers to come here. And just talking about yourself for a moment, you, you've created, led, and directed private and public companies spanning a wide range of industries, including mobile analytics, big data, enterprise software, financial services, and pharma. So, one of the questions I'd love to ask is, what are the biggest lessons that you've learned along the way? And 
is there any advice that you'd pass down to others that are maybe listening at the beginning of their journey? Yeah, you know what? It's an um, uh, interesting question. Um, I, I think on a personal level, I have to say that my experience was always built without something like Mars to be a launch pad. Um, so if you like, I, I have the contrast of, you know, uh, uh, before Mars and after Mars. <laughs> but my experience building my companies is that, you know, you can have the best idea, the best discovery, uh, the best intellectual property, all the technology and talent and team and strategy. But all that is just table stakes. The fact is that Darwin's laws of natural selection work perfectly in the entrepreneurial space. And I think by my count, when I was investing, only one out of a thousand companies, and here I'm being generous, only one out of a thousand were ever able to break through to getting to the scale up stage. By that, I mean, you know, 30 to $50 million in net revenues, 300 to 500 employees growing 50% per year. You know, most companies die and even worse, they become zombies just because they can't survive the external exogenous events that they just don't control. So, you know, the, the entire thesis of Mars is that we have assembled the entire connected value chain that fuels the entrepreneurial journey. We know that inertia kills and we know that velocity wins. Um, and the longer you take in this journey, the more susceptible you are to the Darwin's laws and the gauntlet. So we think that uh, uh, entrepreneurs, I think that entrepreneurs have to work to create choices have to always have optionality. You may not always make the right choice, but if you don't have choices when you need them, then you're always gonna be a price taker and not a market maker. And our entrepreneurs are here to be market makers. Um, so there's, there's several things I can relate to from sort of a before Mars and during Mars experience, but they come down to the same things. How do you take the transaction cost out of the entrepreneurial journey? How do you increase velocity? How do you take up inertia? How do you get access, for instance, today at Mars? Our entrepreneurs, of course, they need talent. Of course, they need capital. Of course, they need customers. Of course, they need corporate partners and global partners. They today need regulators as well to be on their side. They need policy amplifiers. Uh, none of that can be done by any single organization, venture, entrepreneur by themselves anymore. So the value of something like Mars is we are taking all the inertia out. We're connecting that value chain. We're basically allowing the entrepreneur to have the best shot at getting through that gauntlet of succeeding through Darwin's laws. Fantastic advice. And here in 2019, of course, you're helping innovators change the world quite literally. But can you tell me more about how Mars is supporting Canada's most promising startups and also helping them grow, create jobs and solve society's greatest challenges? Is that something you can expand on? I'd love to, actually. It's one of the things that really does differentiate uh, Mars and Toronto and Canada. Um, you know, we, we have this moment where, you know, Canada is a bit of a destination. Um, you know, and again, I think, you know, what's the cause of that? Uh, there's a populist move going on around the world right now, but Canada is always seen as an inclusive place in which to really build not just companies that drive massive economic value, but also companies with massive economic value that can change the world for the better. So we're after both the impact and the value creation equation. And I'm really specific here that this is not an or. In our view, inclusive innovation is an and. And, you know, you can think about, uh, are, you, you know, are you a proponent of Milton Friedman in terms of uh, profit and shareholder value creation? Or are you a proponent of, you know, Keynesian economics, you know, which is all about sort of uh, uh, how, do you, how do you incentivize uh, uh, economic uh, um, impact? And I think this is an end. Um, we have a moment in time where massive, you know, requirements uh, for that affect real people and real communities and real businesses Everything from climate change to health and longevity with wellness through to how do you reduce urban innovation, the urban uh, uh, congestion and uh, get affordable housing in place through smart urban innovation at a time when we're sitting on a mega trend of, you know, 50 percent growth in the world's population over the next 30 years. I mean, these are massive challenges. And I believe Toronto, Mars, Canada, we believe that entrepreneurs have a massive role to play 
in terms of helping to solve for these massive grand challenges. So yes, we're here to create, based in Canada, global powerhouse companies that can drive economic value, create sustainability for Canadians and for Canada. But also those very same entrepreneurs are probably going to be who we bet on to solve for climate change in the 11 years we have left underneath the IPCC, to solve for wellness, not just longevity, to solve for urban congestion and affordable housing uh, at a time when, look, if we don't do these things, we're actually sitting on some massive problems. So if we look a little bit deeper at all those startups, the ones that you're helping to grow and creating these jobs and solving the greatest challenges, are there any success stories that you can share with us today that will maybe help everyone listening visualize just what a difference you're making? Sure. Uh, great question, Neil. Uh, you know, there's 1,308 uh, ventures that I'm aware of so far. Um, and, and so, you know, we don't have enough time in your podcast to actually roll <laughs> through all of those, I'm sure. <laughs> But let me let me pick through two that are that are probably really interesting and, and and they reflect the fact that Mars itself is a science and technology deep tech ecosystem. So we focus on on these kinds of companies. So in in one case we have uh, you know deep genomics. Uh, Dr. Brendan Frey uh, is a co-founder at the Vector Institute along with Dr. Jeffrey Hinton, and he is a professor at the University of Toronto has both a medical and an engineering background. He's applying AI and deep learning to the drug discovery process. So essentially, his thesis is to digitally sequence in silico, which means digitally, not through mouse trials only, a billion molecules. I mean, when you think about that, that's a task that would never have been able to be conceived without the aspects of deep learning and, and machine learning and artificial intelligence. The goal is sequence a billion molecules in search of the next 1,000 compounds that can cure disease states. That's an amazing impact story. And of course, along the way, he's being recognized by financings uh, and recognition from some of the, you know, uh, the most progressive and the most um, well-known sources of capital in the world, Uh, you know, including Coastal Ventures and, and the rest. So, it's a great story, and I think, you know, if I was to think about the outcome where, where Deep Genomics and Dr. Brendan Frey could go, they could be and should be, you know, the biggest uh, uh, pharmaceutical drug discovery company in, in, in Canada, if not North America, uh, if all this comes about. Uh, a second one I point to is also based on science and technology, uh, Canvas Analytics with Humera Malik. Uh, now, Humera uh, came to Canada from Pakistan. Um, and she had a storied career um, working with some of the large global 2000 companies. She decided to start her own company in order to use artificial intelligence to convert traditional manufacturing factory floors with advanced manufacturing practices. So think about, you know, your traditional manufacturing assembly line or, you know, um, your, uh, your factory floor logistics and overlay that with big data analytics and internet IoT devices to ingest millions of points of real-time operational data. Uh, And then think about applying her algorithm and her platform to optimize in real-time these operations. Essentially, it's taking traditional incumbent industries and future-proofing them as transformation and as disruption happens in the world around us. I mean, I love these these companies because you know, and again, there's another 1,306 to go, but I won't sort of uh, try and you know cover them all. But the point is, these companies aren't just innovation for innovation. They are innovation to drive impact, to touch real people, that change real businesses, that get you to sustainability. So if we have a startup founder listening today that wants to find out more about how they can get involved, can you tell me a little bit more about how to get how to get started and how you're going to help high impact Canadian tech ventures grow and succeed? Because I'm, I'm sure we've got a lot of people listening that are going to be want to be quite proactive and get involved. So any pointers you can give, I think will be incredibly helpful. Well, first of all, I point out that uh, uh, while Mars is, uh, you know, the largest uh, hub uh, here in North America, we actually live in a really connected ecosystem. That's another thing about Canada. We don't play the zero sum game here. Um, So, uh, you know, we don't think about institutions so much as we think about entrepreneurs in the ecosystem here. If you think about uh, uh, innovation, 
it can happen anywhere. Um, it can happen anywhere nationally across Canada, right here in Ontario, a province in Canada. We have Communitech based around the University of Waterloo. We have uh, the DMZ, which is, I think, the number one ranked uh, business incubator at university campus. Uh, they're based at Ryerson. Uh, we have several campus-linked accelerators, which are doing top-notch work at the University of Toronto. And, of course, you have Mars as well. And we're all connected because we see entrepreneurs as the North Star, not the individual institutions. Um, and, you know, as, as an entrepreneur, I think what you want to do is, is find birds uh, of a feather that you can flock with. So you want to be near um, uh, people that you can learn from, uh, companies that you can partner with, um, hubs which bring uh, all of those elements that you're going to need. Every entrepreneur is going to need different things at different stages of their growth from, you know, capital providers to talent through to partners, through to customers. And, and so I would just immerse yourself um, in a connected ecosystem like this. Our best entrepreneurs actually travel across and live across all of these hubs. Because as we know, talent is borderless. Uh, entrepreneurial activity is borderless. Capital is borderless. Um, you, you have to basically create those choices for yourself by associating with the rest of the ecosystem. Um, Mars yourself, you can find out more about Mars through our website. It's a very, very rich website with a ton of content and ways to actually engage, not just read about what's going on. And you can find us at uh, www.marsdd.com. Uh, and we're on Twitter at, uh, at sign MarsDD. So there's tons of things going on. I just encourage uh, attendance, uh, following, uh, get our newsletter. Uh, we're connected to the rest of the ecosystem. And uh, it's, it's uh, once you're in, it's Hotel California here, Neil. You can, <laughs> you can choose to check in, but once you're in, you can never check back out. I love it. Well, I love what, everything that you're talking about here, and your career is nothing short of inspirational. And I love how you're making a real difference in the world by leveraging technology. But if you were to look back at that career, is there anything that you're particularly proud of or most proud of? What I'm most proud of? Wow. Uh, well, I won't tell you how old I am because that'll basically give them the ghost. But um, <laughs> when I when I take a look at the top view. You know, um, when I started my first company, and I'm going to say it's decades ago, um, that was uh, started on my credit cards. Uh, it ended up, ended, ended up becoming 400 people plus and uh, Oracle Financial Services before we were through. And then I went on to start another four or five companies after that. And I would say, you know, I would never have imagined back then with that first company and those three credit cards <laughs> that... Mars would exist in the state that it is. We have, you know, one and a half million square feet, less than a 1% vacancy. It's the lowest vacancy rate outside of Tokyo, believe it or not. 80,000 tech jobs just in the last five years were created out of the Toronto area. I would never have imagined that to be possible. And so when I look back at my career, what I'm most proud of is, yeah, I had some great runs. We created some great companies. We got to some great liquidity events. Not all, but the ones that were great were just unbelievable. But all that, I think my greatest achievements have always been to see the people that have come out of those companies. The people that came out of those companies to go on and build and grow their own exciting operations and to drive massive impact on the work that they do. Um, yeah, I can't take any credit for what I know to be the incredible passion and work ethic and dedication that it has taken to build each of their own operations. But it's extremely satisfying to know that in many ways we shared a journey together and that in some ways many of the things that we did while we were together are at the heart of what they are doing now and building their own companies out. And, you know, I came out of retirement to lead Mars. So this is a bit of a, you know, I, I couldn't dream of a better bucket list item to do right now because we're doing at scale what gave me the most pleasure when I was doing it sort of serially as a serial entrepreneur. 
And I absolutely love how you mentioned there that it is all about people. And that's a lot of it. It's not about our own egos and our own personal missions. It is about people. And none of us are able to achieve any form of success without a little help along the way, if we're all honest with each other. So is there a particular person that you're grateful towards who who might have helped you along the way or inspire you? You know what? Uh, there were a mi- there, there were so many, but I'm going to I'm going to come back to my father. I won the lottery when he came out of Taiwan at the time. Taiwan was run by Chiang Kai-shek, who was a military a military autocracy. It's not a good place for you know idealists uh, who are free thinkers, who are science uh, related, who who you know believed in uh, you know the future. Uh, it, it, I mean, it was just not a great place. I would never have been able to get access to the opportunities that I had had he not made the move to come out of Taiwan then and come to Canada. I know that I won the lottery when he made that choice. He probably didn't have the same opportunities I had, but my goodness, um, everything that I now have access to was because he made those original decisions. I don't take that for granted. You know, I think that immigrants, there's a really tight line between immigrants and entrepreneurs when you have nothing to lose and everything to gain you essentially have the choices to actually go and do things like this um and uh you know i mean even here in toronto over 50 percent of the population comes from outside of canada there's a really high quotient of entrepreneurs here because of that mentality of anything is possible over here and when you come from outside of canada when you come from a place that you know doesn't have those things that we take for granted in a place like Canada, you value them, you treasure them, you never let them go. And you, you know, when you have them, you, you must, you must make something out of them. So my father, I think. That's a beautiful answer. And we've talked about your journey, your life, your family, and the great work you're doing with Mars. But if we now, I'm not going to ask you to gaze into a crystal ball, but if, if we look into the future, is there anything that particularly excites you about that, and especially around using technology to make a difference in the world? Yeah, we kind of touched on it, Neil. Um, but uh, I, I actually think part of how we solve for a future, which is at, at some points terrifying and at other points completely exhilarating, and at most points actually a combination of both, is we have to basically leverage the work of our entrepreneurs. There's, there's a real difference when, you know, as an entrepreneur, you wake up and you know, if you don't solve an important problem that people want to have solved, you don't get to eat that day. Your employees may not get to work that day. Maybe you don't have a future attached to what you're trying to do. And, and so I think there's something about harnessing the work of our entrepreneurs to drive for major points of impact. You know, many of our entrepreneurs and many of our team here at Mars, I mean, they're, they're, they're young people, they're millennials. In many ways, you know, people of my generation uh, have mortgaged their future. Um, you know, we're, we're sitting here with the IPCC report from the United Nations talking about the fact that last year they said we have 12 years left to make every single important decision in order to affect a catastrophic future that may come at us from climate change in the next 30 years, by 2050. Um, Look, it's 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 going to be the work of our entrepreneurs that drives things like you know greenhouse gas emissions and taking them down. Um, if you if you got two minutes, Neil, I'd like to tell you a little story about our 200 plus uh, clean tech entrepreneurs. Out of the 1,300 entrepreneurs we have here, there's about 200 and uh, change who are focused on the clean tech space. Uh, 13 of those entrepreneurs were listed in the top 100 index, the top clean tech. Uh, uh, concerns going on in the world. So we're punching way above our weight from the point of view of things that impact real people. Canada produces 700 megatons of greenhouse gas emissions every single year. In the world, there's 36 gigatons of greenhouse gas emissions produced every single year. If I took just five of those 200 plus uh, um, Ventures. And I said, what happens if we, Mars, helps them to scale? Uh, they got proven technology, proven products. Let's take uh, carbon sequestration, which takes greenhouse gases and re-injects them into the concrete manufacturing process. Let's take biogas generation from waste products. Let's take uh, renewable energy storage at scale. 
um, you know, I can go through five of these companies, and if Mars helps get them to be based in Canada, but global powerhouse companies, we can basically bring down Canada's total emission count by one gigaton per year. Wow. So the math says five companies can take out all of Canada's greenhouse gas emissions and still have more or less to contribute to a reduction in the rest of the world. I haven't counted the other 195 companies that are on our roster. So that's what excites me, Neil, is that we can solve for major things that impact global you know, populations, the, 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 the survivability and sustainability of the planet, which can then lead to long-term competitive sustainable advantage for our companies. We can solve for all of that by harnessing the work of our entrepreneurs and in the work of a deep tech ecosystem like Mars. And, and I think ultimately, again, you know, for someone that's part of a generation that arguably mortgaged the future for our youth, um, we have to give back. We have to enable this to happen. We have to create something sustainable for future generations to come. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Now, you did mention a few moments ago your website and how to follow you on Twitter, etc. But can you just remind everyone listening of where they can find you online and also contact your team if they do have any questions? Because I've got a feeling there's going to be a lot of people that feel quite that this is their true calling when they listen to this on their, on their <laughs> commute to the office. Well, at least I hope they do. Uh, so if you could point yeah. them in the right direction, that'd be brilliant. I'd love to. Um, so one more time, it's uh, uh, marsdd.com. That's spelled M-A-R-S, just like the planet. D-D, standing for Discovery District, dot com. And we are on Twitter at marsdd. Uh, you can sign up for our newsletter register on our site. Uh, we have a ton of content on there, including resources for Entrepreneurship 101, uh, Entrepreneur's Toolkits, our magazines, our events. Uh, it's a way to get digitally immersed into the world of innovation as seen from the eyes of uh, the Mars, the institution, not Mars, the planet. But, you know, maybe join us. Uh, join us on a couple of missions from Mars to help solve for some big impacts. And uh, come to Toronto, Neil. You have an open ticket. We'd love to see you here. Uh, it'll take you more than a few minutes to walk through one and a half million square feet, but I'm happy to do that. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I'm going to hold you to that. We will meet in person one day, I promise you. I mean, you've delivered so much value in, what, 25 minutes and a 25-minute conversation today. When you first came on, I think you said inertia kills and velocity wins the day. But when we dig deeper, it really is about family, people solving real problems and using tech to make a difference. And it doesn't get any better than that. So a big thank you for taking the time to come on and share that story with me today. Thanks. Well, thank you for having me, Neil. Wonderful talking to you. Beyond leading Mars, Jung has an interesting background and has had a dynamic career in tech. He started out as an immigrant to Canada and as a serial entrepreneur, which has enabled him to create, lead and direct private and public companies spanning a wide range of industries like he was talking about there in the mobile analytics, big data space enterprise software, financial services, and pharma. And he has been deservedly recognised as one of Canada's top 40 under 40 leaders. So for me, that was a unique conversation that touches on the broader tech ecosystem. Not only what's happening in Toronto and Canada, but indeed the entire world, and how Jung's own journey has informed his role today, leading one of the largest innovation hubs. So wherever you listen in the world, I want to hear about how technology is being used to make a difference. Because in the last few days, we've spoken to people now in every, everywhere from Mozambique to Toronto and Silicon Valley. But I want to put every country on the map and showcase how we are all the same and trying to make a difference. And let's just banish and retire those lazy old stereotypes once and for all. So it's an open invitation to everybody listening. And my email address, you can contact me directly, is techblogwriter at outlook.com. My website is techblogwriter.co.uk. And if you scroll to the bottom, you can find out all the contact details and social media channels. Whatever is your format of choice, you should be able to get hold of me nice and easily. So as always, I look forward to hearing your thoughts, your insights, your opinions, or even just ask me a question or tell me where it is that you listen to this podcast. So a big thank you from me as always for tuning in. But until next time, 
don't be a stranger. Thanks for listening to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast. Until next time, remember, technology is best when it brings people together.